Now take your Bibles, please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We talked about the Feast of Passover in our last message. Now we come to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is an interesting feast because it begins the day after Passover. The first day of unleavened bread is a Shabbat, a holy convocation. No work can be done. So there's two days in a row. Uh, The feast is seven days long. And on the end of it, you also have another Shabbat, another holy convocation. Anyway, uh, follow along as I read. Exodus chapter 12, verses 15 to 20. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, look at this, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now when somebody says, Well, what difference does this make? Well, if you're Jewish, it makes a lot of difference. You will be cut off if you violate it. Wow. In the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. In the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance. How long? I'm sorry. Forever. There you go. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, we learned in our message of the Passover, that's the day of Passover. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, that evening, evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, here it is again, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he be a stranger or born in the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Now go over to chapter 13, please, and look at verse 6 and 7. Chapter 13, verse 6 and 7. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Here it is again. In Leviticus 23, in the opening verses, we learn... These are feasts called holy convocations or celebrations. It's to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven, that's simply the word yeast, seen with thee in all thy quarters. Wow. Pretty powerful stuff. Now, the spring celebrations, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and tomorrow morning we'll be dealing with Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit in power upon God's people. Don't miss it. Now, um, in looking at this, and try, there we go. Unleavened Bread is our subject. That's what we're going to eat for seven days after Passover. Also, Uh, Here are the feasts. I don't know why this isn't working. Have I done something wrong? Oh, back it up one. Yeah, all right. There's the spring celebrations. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Now, I don't know why. There we go. We need to coordinate. Amen. Amen. But this little thing, I don't know. Be healed! Oh, anyway. (laughs) Let's start with the demand to eat only unleavened bread. Actually, the command is clear. This command is very, very clear. Look again at Exodus 12, 15. 
Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Very clear. Chapter 23 of Exodus, if you turn over there to verse 15, thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread, here it comes, as I commanded thee. Well, if you're in a church or denomination that believes you are the children of Israel, then you're under some severe uh, demands and commands about unleavened bread. Now, in addition to the command being clear, uh, we have a second thing, and that is the consequence for not doing it is also very clear. In verse 15 of chapter 12, we read, Whosoever eateth leavened bread, regular bread, from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Verse 19 adds, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Now, the ceremonies, uh, in fact, here we go again. The ceremonies that involve unleavened bread, and we'll put them up there. Look at what you have to do. You have to eat unleavened bread at the feast, of course, for seven days. The meal offering, the Thanksgiving offering, the peace offering, the blood sacrifices, and the burnt offerings. Now, several of you were a little confused over my remark about the Passover when we were talking about the Shabbat and that uh, Nisan the 14th Passover is a Shabbat, a Sabbath day. The next day is the first day of unleavened bread. It is also treated as a Sabbath day. In Matthew 28, verse 1, it says, Now, after the Sabbath, but the Greek text has plural, after the Sabbaths. You're going to have to have two or more before you have the resurrection, which celebrates the Feast of first fruits. We'll get to that in just a moment. So you've got a lot of this going on. By the way, the peace offering is offered on the first day of unleavened bread. Why am I telling you that? Because people ask me, when was Jesus crucified? Uh, there is a traditional Roman Catholic view uh, dealing with Good Friday that he died on Friday. I happen to believe that's a possibility. Some people believe Thursday. Some people believe Wednesday. I believe he died on Friday. Think of how often God connects that with the peace offering. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. You see, when they offered the peace offering, there was one dying who made peace between Jew and Gentile, according to Ephesians chapter 2. Those of you familiar with that. Well, uh, let's go on. The commitment to do this, people ask me about it all the time. Well, that was for then, not now. Wrong. Uh, according to the Bible, uh, it is to last how long? Forever. Exodus twelve seventeen. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Now something else, the clearing out of leaven from your house is also commanded. Uh, people wonder why are the Jewish people doing that? Oh, that seems so silly. No, it's not. Exodus twelve nineteen. Seven days shall there be no leaven, no yeast found in your houses. Get the bread out of there. Exodus twelve twenty. In all your habitation shall you eat unleavened bread. Exodus thirteen verse seven. There shall no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters, wherever you are. No touching of bread, nothing to do with yeast or making some nice muffins. Amen? So what you're going to eat is this stuff. It has no taste. By the way, when you go to the store to buy it in a box, some of them have them flavored with egg and onion and even garlic, um, just for the record. Get the pure stuff. Totally tasteless, and you wonder why you're eating it. 
Yeah, okay. Now we got a little commentary here also uh, on why it should be done. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Why should we do this if you're the children of Israel? What's the answer to that? It's very interesting. Deuteronomy 16 verse 3. That thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt. Now watch this. All the days of thy life. Now if you see Jewish people constantly talking about uh, leaving Egypt, uh, the exodus, all of that. Oh, by the way, this is a cute little story. You know, uh, there was a movie called Exodus quite a while ago. And they had the uh, music in there of Exodus. Do you remember that? Well, the first time I ever went to Egypt was 1970. And uh, I was in the Shepherd's Hotel, very Egyptian. And um, they had a concert grand piano there. And the guy was playing stuff. And so I went up to him and started talking to him. And he said, do you play? I said, yeah, a little bit. He said, well, uh, here's the piano. Why don't you play something? <laughs> now, it's in an, an auditorium that seats a 1,000 people. There are Egyptians. And I sat down without thinking and started playing Exodus. I had to stop because they are yelling and screaming and throwing things at me and everything else. I, I didn't even realize what I was playing. So anyway, just thought you ought to know that. Now number uh, seven, the characteristic, this is very interesting, of the people when eating unleavened bread. In Second Chronicles 30 verse 21 it says, the children of Israel kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness. Now, some of my Jewish friends are very sorrowful. Either they don't like Passover, they certainly don't like eating unleavened bread for seven days. But you're to do it with great gladness. Ezra, chapter 6, verse 22. They kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy. Well, how did that happen? Listen to this, the last phrase of that verse. For the Lord had made them joyful. Amen. Hey, praise God. Amen. Yeah, the tasteless sun living bread for seven days. Oh, praise the Lord. Hey, it makes me so happy. Sure. Put some more horseradish on it. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, right. I can tell you this, only the Lord can make you jo joyful with unleavened bread. Now, here is the teaching that we are not delivering to our congregations as we should. You say, what are you talking about? The danger of leaven. What is the danger of leaven or yeast? It's interesting. Number one. It's a substance, cakes, muffins, breads, and so forth, that affects all that it touches. In other words, fermentation. Now, this matzah that you're looking at is not fermented because there's no yeast in it. So it's more of a fitting symbol of the sinless body of our Savior. Amen? That could take our sin upon him. So remember that. Uh, that's very, very important. That's also true of the cup that we talked about in Passover. Uh, people say, well, a little wine, I, you know, I, I like to drink it. And, you know, that's okay by me. Fill up my cup again. No, no, no. Uh, they mix three parts water with the wine in any condition to make sure it was not fermented. Why? Because it represents the blood of the sacrificial animal or the precious blood of our Lord Jesus in our communion. Why in the world would you serve regular alcoholic beverage? That's nonsense. Because fermentation, as we all know, is a decay process. You're losing the vitamins of that grape juice by letting it ferment or putting in mixed grains 
which the Bible translates as strong drink. We have no business in playing around with this, folks. We are presenting in our communion services, and I don't care what churches do here or how they argue it. It's unleavened bread, and the cup is not of pure wine or alcoholic beverage. You put grape juice in there. If you want to do it Jewish style, go to the market and buy Kedem, K-E-D-E-M. It's delicious. It's grape juice. Amen? (laughs) There was only half the audience that said amen. Okay. That's number one. That's the first thing we notice. Number two uh, is that it's a symbol of that which is sinful. Uh Uh-oh. You know, the Jewish Talmud even says that leaven represents the evil impulse of the heart. Well, how does it a symbol of that which is sinful? Well, we know from the Lord Jesus, turn to Matthew 16, that it symbolizes the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 16, you got it open? Verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Religious leaders have always put legalistic definitions upon the pure liberty of the gospel. Always. Well, you know, you got to have stained glass windows. And I looked all around this place, can't see any. They must be there because you had them in the old place. I don't know. Do you see any? At least they're not showing. Well, this might be revolutionary to you, but you don't need stained glass windows. Amen? Amen. You don't need robes either. I was at a very high church. I don't even know why they asked me. Um, The pastor said, uh, what size are you? He called me earlier. I said, well, real men start at 4X and go up. Well, they got me robes and all of that. Had a big chain around my neck with a gold cross with diamonds, you know. And uh, he said, well, do you want to wear this? I said, is there an option? Do I have to wear it? He said, oh, no, you don't have to wear it. I said, then I'll wear it. He said, what would you have said If I said you had to wear it, I wouldn't have worn it. He said, you're strange. You're not the first one who recognized that. Listen, folks, that legalism is everywhere. Robes, jewelry, rings, you name it. It's all the accoutrements of what makes religion what it is. And Jesus condemned that stuff. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Wow. Okay, take heed, beware of the leaven of Pharisees and Sadducees, and they reason among themselves. Here's the disciples. They didn't get it. Uh, It's because we've taken no bread. They had no bread with them. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because you've brought no bread. Do you not yet understand, neither remember, the five loaves or the 5,000? How many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves or the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. How is it you don't understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and Pharisees. In Mark chapter 8, verse 15, he charged them saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Oh boy. Jews liked him because of all he did in his construction projects in Judea. But the man was, as Jesus said, that fox. You know, you can't trust a thing he says. 
the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, why is this again? Well, because it also symbolizes hypocrisy. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You want to know about hy- hypocrisy among religious leaders? Then read Matthew chapter 23, the famous passage about woe unto you, woe unto you. And he's talking about the religious trappings. You follow the tradition of the elders instead of the commandment of God. When people tell me what we're supposed to do, I want to know what verse. How about you? I don't want to get involved in doing anything that's man-made traditions that gets me away from the power, freshness, and beauty of the Word of God. How about you? So important. But there's something else here. It also symbolizes malice and wickedness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Therefore let's keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Listen, folks, unleavened bread means a lot more than people have understood. And I'll show you that before we're done. Let's talk about the decision to eat bread that's leavened. Well, the restrictions imply that at other times it is permitted, besides the festivals, and its relationship uh, to, in fact, the uh, uh, Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, points to the beginning of a new relationship between Jew and Gentile, of course. But here's what I want to talk to you about. There, I just said that, and I just said number two also. What is in the world the matter? There it is. That's what we will learn before we're done this weekend. Now, the description of unleavened bread as it relates to our Lord Yeshua. Now we get into some interesting matters. One, it points to his physical body. Where do you get that? Luke twenty-two nineteen. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, some say that's referring to the church. No, it's not. It's referring to Jesus. The unleavened bread represents the sinlessness of our Lord, who therefore could bear our sin in his own body on the tree. In 1 Corinthians 17, 24, uh, excuse me, um, that should be eleven twenty four. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And for as often as you eat this bread, chapter 11, verse 26, you do show the Lord's what? Till he come. I'm sorry. The Lord's death. Till he come. You mean to tell me that after I become a Christian, God wants me to never forget that my Lord died for me on the cross and paid for all my sins. Amen. That he is the sinless son of God. Well, you know the virgin birth guaranteed his sinlessness. No, it did not. That's false doctrine taught by a lot of pastors. Uh-uh. He was the sinless son of God before he was ever born as a baby in Bethlehem. The virgin birth never did guarantee his sinlessness. He already was sinless. He is the sinless, pure, unadulterated, wonderful Savior who knew no sin that the righteousness of God might be found in it. Praise the Lord, huh? Amen. It points to his physical body. 
Next, it proclaims his death till he comes, which we just mentioned. And we need to understand that. Every time at a Passover, when we break the second piece of three pieces in a beautiful Pesach cloth, when we break it, we are symbolizing his death in our behalf. God never wants us to forget that his son, our Savior, came into the world. The Son of Man, Luke 19.10, has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Are you lost? I don't care how much sin you have. We say, well, I'm not good enough. Well, none of us are. There's none good, no, not one. Well, you know, I'm not as bad as some. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. As soon as you get married, your wife will know. You might shine and smile at church and everything, but where you are at home is where you usually are. But I take a step further. I believe that where, what you are in the dark is what you are. When no one else knows, you think. But God does. He knows. Well, how much of my sin did he take on himself? Well, because he was sinless, he could bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Well, here's something interesting. It also promotes the fellowship of believers one with another. According to the Bible, the bread which we break is the communion. The Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship. What we share in common. Well, what is it that we share in common? Now listen to me. People want to have the same uh, likes and dislikes with others. Listen, I've actually met Christians that don't like Monday night football. I don't understand that at all. It's one of the few spirit-filled events on television. And you tell me you don't like it? Now you understand that we're all different. Our likes and dislikes are not the same. But when churches get in trouble, they try to enforce the same likes and dislikes upon the congregation. Uh-uh. You're all different. You're all word, weird. What I say is if you knew what was in the heart of the person sitting next to you right now, you would move. <laughs> For all you know, that guy's a serial killer or that woman. You understand? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. But it's I, the Lord, that searches the heart, the reins of the heart, Jeremiah 17, 10. Be very careful. You see, what also we learn is it presents the need of faith. Why? As often as you eat this bread, our Lord taught, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is gracious, said Peter. You see, taste is symbolizing faith. You have to take it and put that crummy stuff in your mouth and chew it up. And you have to do that in order to illustrate the fellowship of believers, yes, but the need of faith. I need to trust what the Bible says about my Lord Yeshua. He is the sinless Son of God. He is the eternal Son of God. The Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Greek word is logos, meaning revelation. In the beginning was the revelation. The revelation was with God. The Greek word is pros, meaning facing. There's equality between the Father and Son. I and my Father are one. And the Word, logos, revelation, was and is God. And in verse 14 of John 1, it says the Word became flesh. Now many translations say the Word was flesh. No, that's wrong. It's a Greek word, genomai, a special word, which means a change of condition. It means that before that, he was something other than the flesh he took upon himself when he became a baby in Bethlehem. 
Is that all there is to Jesus, that baby? (laughs) Oh, no. No. He is the infinite, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, immutable, Lord of Lords. But it does position him in a place of equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because there are three pieces of matzah on the table. The only explanation is that it's representing the tri-unity of God. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But my dear friends, (laughs) God can be more than one. Why? Every synagogue in the world quotes every Shabbat, what we call the Shema or the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he better be yours, is one Lord. Well, if he's one, he can't be two. Wrong. In Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. You see, the Hebrew word echad is more than one. If you want to get a grasp on this, get our book out there at the table called The God of the Bible. One of the chapters in that is, Is God More Than One? I don't like the word Trinity because it implies in English three gods. We don't have three gods. There's only one God. But he can manifest himself as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. I prefer the words Tri-unity. Very important. By the way, one times one equals what? Not two, but one. Even mathematically we understand these things. It positions him in a place of equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Number six, it propagates the truth of his sinfulness, sinlessness. No leaven. Second Corinthians 5.21. It says he knew no sin. Hebrews 4.15. He was yet without sin. Wow. And number seven, it pictures his suffering for us. How is that? In Isaiah 53.5, It says, by his stripes we are healed. That's repeated in 1 Peter 2.24. Is that talking about physical healing? No, it is not. But it's being used that way by false teachers in the pulpit. No. It's quoted so you can understand it in 1 Peter 2.24. It says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. It quotes Isaiah 53, verse 5. Now, let's pick up the matzah bread and take another look at it. I'm sure you can't see it from where you're sitting, but there are, because it's pressed on a griddle when it is made, there are stripes in the bread. You see, the unleavened bread is a beautiful symbol of our Lord's suffering for us. By his stripes, ye were healed. There's no doubt about it when we take a trip to Israel that one of the places we want to go are the ruins of the Tower of Antonio. And some things have not changed from the time of our Lord. At that uh, interesting place, You go down to the pavement, and it's the old Roman pavement. And on there you can see the game of the king carved in the stones that the soldiers played. You can also see the road where the chariots would follow those indentations in that road. I love to have the people down there and read the story of the suffering of our Lord. That's where they beat our Lord's head with a rod. That's where they slugged him repeatedly with their fists. That's where 
They spit on him as they walked by him. That's where the Roman scourge, nine leather straps, and periodically a stone in them. Most men died because the Romans were not merciful as Jews were. Jews said only 39 stripes, no more. But the Romans could keep it up. You know, the Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson had a lot of things wrong with it. There were things that were not biblical. But there's one thing he did that the whole world of journalism criticized, if you remember, and it was the Roman scourging of Jesus. Do you remember that? My wife and I decided not to go with all the church groups that went to see that, but we went to a regular group, and all around us were unbelievers. There was a man and his wife sitting right in front of us in the theater, and when that scourging took place, she breaks down crying, and he says, swearing every other word, I had no idea they did that to him. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry, I try, but I can't. I tapped them on the shoulders. They turned around. I said, it's kind of frightening, isn't it, to realize that the Bible says that's what they did to Jesus. He looked at me and he said, well, what else did they do? I said, they crucified him. So he's a helpless victim of the Romans, and how in the world can he save anybody? Wow. I said, you need some Bible teaching. (laughs) He said, I don't know. I'm very uncomfortable with you. I think you belong to him. (laughs) And he and his wife got up and tried to run out ahead of us. I ran after them until my wife grabbed me and said, David, don't, don't, don't. Let the Holy Spirit work, you know, I... I don't know. The stripes he suffered. Wow. That was my Lord. Unbelievable. But there's something else. Not only by the stripes he suffered, but by the spear he received in his side. I don't know what you folks know, what you understand. One of the more difficult passages in the Bible is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. The last three chapters of Zechariah are all prophecy about the future and they're great studies. But chapter 12, verse 10 of Zechariah says... And I will pour upon the house of Israel, the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. In John 19.34... It says one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And forthwith came there out blood and water. And John 36 and 37 says, These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. They shall look on him whom they pierced. You know, in 1 John 5, there are two verses that uh, many translations in English of the Bible have a hard time with because it appears to teach um, that Jesus came by blood and water and the Spirit of God prophesied it and pointed it out. And it appears that The whole triunity of God is there. And boy, people hate it. They call it the Johannine formula. It's in the old King James, correct. And I love to point it out to people. Why? Because the question is in 1 John 5, 
when you get down to verse 13, that we know that we've been born again if we believe the witness the Spirit gave of Jesus dying on that cross. People don't get it, reading 1 John 5. You take those verses out, as so many English translations do, and you don't get the point. Where do we read that the Spirit of God bore witness to our spirit about this? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Because Romans 8 says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I want to know that I'm a child of God, don't you? I want to know I'm really born again, not because you say so or my church says it. I want to know it in my heart. Now, how do I know it? Well, the Bible says you trust what the Spirit witnessed to. Well, where do you do that? Well, the same guy that wrote 1 John 5 wrote the Gospel of John, chapter 19. He was an eyewitness. Do you understand the Spirit witnessed the blood and water that came out of his side when that spear went into him, thus proving he really died physically. Did God die spiritually? Of course not. Did he die physically? Yes, he did. Wow. Oh, but don't sweat it. The third day after, he rose from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. You see, my friends, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Yeshua is the matzot of life. He is the unleavened bread of life. In John 6, 35, Yeshua said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. In chapter 6, verse 47 and 48, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. In John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I don't want to miss a, a communion service in which the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus are being honored. This is the basis of my faith, what I believe. He died for me. He suffered for me, excruciating torment and pain. Wow. Well, I have... Uh, I have one more thing to say to you. On the day after the regular weekly Sabbath, in the week in which Passover occurs, doesn't care if it's on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever, whatever is nice on, on the Jewish lunar calendar, on the 14th is Passover. The 15th is the first day of unleavened bread. On the regular Sabbath that week, on Saturday, the Bible says in Leviticus 23, on the morrow after the Sabbath, that's Sunday, that's when we have the festival of first fruits. When this time, the priest is going to wave these loaves of bread. But actually, it's unleavened bread at this point, it's the barley harvest. Fifty days later is the wheat harvest. Christ is the first fruits of them that slept, says the Bible. How interesting. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they are Christ at his coming. You know, I have a lot of little illustrations. I don't know if they get to you or not. But uh, 
my wife and I decided to make arrangements for our death. Kind of a morbid subject. But we went to the mortuary and to the funeral home and the cemetery. And we found out what you actually have to pay to get buried. And I asked the gal, I said, can you just dig a hole and put me in it? No, that's illegal. You'll have to have a box. I said, well, then just give me a pine box and stop all this stuff. I don't want all this flowery stuff. How stupid. It's going in the ground. And don't put anything that you want in my casket. I don't want it there. I said, what would it cost if my wife and I were on top of each other? Because you're saving ground there. She said, well, it is a little cheaper. After I finished with the negotiations and gave her a check for the amount, I said, are there any other costs involved here? She said, no. And as a matter of fact, you have the cheapest funeral that we could possibly give anyone. I said, praise God. I'm not going to be in there long. She said, what? I said, I'm not going to be in there long. She then brought up cremation. I said, now that's a pagan symbol. That's a pagan custom. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't do that. We're not going to burn them. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. We're not going to throw the ashes to the fish in the sea either. We're not going to do that stuff. By the way, the little urns with ashes, they're now costing what the caskets do. They knew how to make money, let me tell you. So I said, we're not going to do that. The Bible says my Lord Yeshua was buried. And the third day he rose again. See, I'm not going to be in there long. He's the first fruits of all who slept. Well, how's that going to happen? I thought you would ask. (laughs) You see, my Lord has so much power. He's going to be able to take the dirt away, whatever he has to do, or maybe he won't. But he's going to be able to get me alive again. Well, you won't want to dig up that body. I said, not that one. I'm going to get a brand new body fashioned like into his glorious body. You're going to wish you believed the same thing when it happens, let me tell you. I wonder how many graves in this big cemetery they're going to come forth. Jesus one day said, Lazarus, come forth. Well, it's a good thing he mentioned his name or everybody would have come out. That's my Lord's power. Amen.